the power of praise. The message is the power of praise. I'm going to read it one more time. Follow with me in Psalm 149. Praise the Lord, sing unto the Lord a new song, and his praise in the assembly of the saints. Let Israel rejoice in their maker. Let the children of Zion be joyful in their king. Let them praise his name with the dance. Let them sing praises to him with the timbrel and harp. For the Lord takes pleasure in his people. He will beautify the humble with salvation. Let the saints be joyful in glory. Let them sing aloud on their beds. Let the high praises of God be in their mouth and a two-edged sword in their hand to execute vengeance on the nations and punishments on the peoples, to bind their kings with fe- the chains and their nobles with fetters of iron, to execute on them the written judgment. This honor have all his saints. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Lord, I just ask that you would help me do justice to open this up a little bit more. And I pray in the name of Jesus that when I'm done, we will never forget this psalm. We will never forget the importance of praising. And we will be equipped with another weapon of war by where we can do damage to the camp of the enemy. In the name of Jesus. Let me preach today in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Everybody said amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. One of the first things when I came into Christ, remember Burl, Anna? She was a a gal that was, uh, Burl, remember? We did Bible studies, uh, the singles did. And I remember asking her, because when I got saved, I was wet behind the ears. I didn't know there was an Old and a New Testament. I knew absolutely nothing. And I said, why does everybody in, around here, we went to a full gospel church, why does everybody around here say, praise the Lord? That sounds like a command, so why are you just telling me praise the Lord? Because it is a command. It didn't make sense at first, but now we say praise the Lord. And everybody should what? Praise Praise the Lord. And when you're in doubt about something, what should you do? Praise Praise the Lord. And so that's how this starts out, and that's how it finishes too. Praise the Lord. And so uh, praise, we talked about Thanksgiving on Thursday. Praise, um, there's really uh, three parts to coming before God, right? Enter his courts with... Thanksgiving and praise. And I always get them backwards. Enter his gates with thanksgiving. thanksgiving and enter his courts with praise. Praise and thanksgiving are ways that we approach the throne of God. Amen? Amen. Don't, you know... I think, you know, my old pastor used to say he loves a cheerful giver, but he'll take money from a grump. And, you know, I, I, we enter with praise. You remember that, Pastor Senior? We enter with praise and thanksgiving. I think we can go in grumpy, but you know what? I think it's a, it's a lot better if we go in thanking God and praising God, right? You know, God responds to faith, not need. He responds to faith, not need. If he responded to need, he'd take care of every poor person. He'd take care of every weak person. He wants us to have faith. And our praising God uh, builds up our faith. And and I I put this here. There's three... uh, Oh, it only... It didn't get the C. There we go. Thanksgiving has to do with God's goodness. Okay? Thank you, Lord, you've been so good. You are good, you are good, right? We sing about it. It's his goodness. He's been good to us personal. Praise has to do with his greatness. And I mentioned that a little bit right after we were done praising. Praise has to do with his greatness. You are great, you are mighty, you alone are worthy, you alone are holy. Right? We're talking about his greatness. And then worship has to do with his holiness. It has to do with his person and character. And, and, and people get confused. And we wrongly call it a worship service. It's like, right? The worship time was really great. It might be really great not because you were worshiping. It might be really great because you were praising. Right? You are entering into high praises. You are remembering how great the Lord is. Right? 
Worship is a little different. We're just humble before God. We're quiet before God. There's, there's an there's a aspect in the Hebrew of worship where people, uh, uh, it's an idea of a dog. You know how a dog will come up to you and they'll be really humble and they'll have their head kind of cocked and come up real lowly? There's that idea in the Hebrew of worship. But praise is a lot different. And so some people have said, well, you know, you need to be reverent in church. Well, there's a time to be reverent in church, and there's a time to be really loud in church too, amen? Do you know that heaven is really noisy, right? They make a, they make a point, and it's just one time that it was quiet for about a half an hour. <laughs> Other than that, it was loud, it's rowdy. It's every time somebody, right now, every time somebody gets saved, and people are getting saved all over the world. You know where they're really getting saved? Over in Iran. They're getting saved online. Do you know that? Every time somebody gets saved, all the angels in heaven rejoice. They have like a party every time somebody gets saved. So I can imagine it's like, you know, the angels go, we got to be really reverent here and everything. It's like, whoa, it just came in. Somebody else got saved. It gets loud and rowdy. Hallelujah. So there's a difference between praise and worship. And, And we... We wrongly call it the, you know, the worship time. This is the worship time and this is the time for the word. No, we mix all praise and worship together. But so Thanksgiving has to do with God's goodness, praise his greatness, and worship his holiness. Psalm 149, we're just going to go through this. Praise the Lord. Sing to the Lord a new song. A fresh song, it says. Cow... Kaudosh is the Hebrew word. It means fresh or new. God does not want us to get stuck in anything, even our worship, right? We've been singing the same hymns here since 1963. Well, good for you. But the Bible says, sing to the Lord a new song. And it might not be new. You might learn a hymn, but it's new to you, right? God wants to put something new in your spirit every single day and so when i love when we bring we try to bring new music something fresh how many love it when a new song gets in your spirit you find yourself singing it in the shower you're you're uh, you know it's just going on and on and on anna says she hears me carrying on downstairs that's my area with the lord but when i get a new song in my spirit i just repeat it over and over and over and over. And it does something in your spirit. It's a, it's, you know, a, a diamond, when a diamond is valuable, it has many, many angles and facets, right? And so when you learn a new facet, when you learn a new uh, um, angle of the character of God, of the goodness of God or something, uh, it, 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 he becomes more value to, valuable to you, right? And so God doesn't buy, want us by rote just to repeat the same things over and on. He says, sing to the Lord a new song and sing his praise in the assembly of the saints. There's something that happens when the saints assemble that will not happen otherwise. God bless you online. You got to get better and get back here. Amen. We miss you when you're not here. Every joint supplies the other one, right? Every joint supplies, when you are not here, it's not the same. It's good, because God's here. Don't get me wrong. But he's the head, and we're the body. We don't want a headless horseman, amen? We're the body, and we need to be joined together. And there's a big difference between an assembly and a gathering. You know that? I can have a giant crate full of parts of a motorcycle, say, for instance. And I can bring that, I could bring that um, uh, box of parts of the motorcycle, and that would be a gathering of parts of the motorcycle, right? That'd be a gathering. But it's really invaluable until it's assembled. And when you have an assembly, then it be, ha, begins to have purpose and have value and have meaning. And if you look at the, the uh, definition, one of them I like of assembly, a group of people gathered together in one place for a common purpose. That's what we are, amen? We're here to worship God. We're here to hear his word. We're here to be built up. 
a pastor's job, a teacher's job, an apostle's job, a prophet's job is to what? Equip the saints for what? The work of the ministry. All the, all the work is not Pastor Anna and I's job. We're trying to equip you to go out and do the work of the ministry, right? Praise the Lord. So sing his praise in the assembly of the saints. Let Israel, verse 2, rejoice in their maker. Let the children of Zion be joyful in their king. I said this Thursday, the kingdom of God is what? Righteousness, peace, and joy. If you're connected to the right God, if you've got a right understanding of God, you should have some joy in your life. Your life. Amen? You should have some joy in your life. You should have some righteous in your, righteousness in your life. You should have some peace in your life. That's the fruit of the Spirit, right? That's the kingdom of God. Righteousness, peace, and joy. Let Israel rejoice in their maker. Rejoicing sounds a little bit rowdy, doesn't it? Like, oh, I'm so excited. Oh, I just rejoiced in my Savior. It's like, I'm excited. When you guys get a check, I'll tell you what, you might be acting, acting a little reserved, but if you get an unexpected check in the mail, that's what rejoicing is. Amen, you're dancing. Yeah, you were dancing. I told of uh, when we got a check just in time to pay for, uh, for uh, our firstborn son. I got so excited. I laid on the entryway. There were other people there. I laid on my back in the entryway and I praised God with all fours. Hallelujah. We should rejoice in the Lord our maker, right? Let Israel, do you know that you are Israel? You are Israel. You are the Israel of God. Yes, there are Israelites. Yes, there are Jews and the natural. But I'll, you look at me like, as Doug says, a cow looking at a new gate. Look at Galatians 6. For in Christ, 6.15. For in Christ... Galatians 6.15. For in Christ, neither circumcision or uncircumcision avails anything. It doesn't matter if you're, a, if you're a Jew by nature or not. Circumcision or uncircumcision does not avail anything but a new creation. Ask Mark Smith if you want to know about a new creation. It's all about being a new creation. And then it goes on to say, as many as walk according to this rule, what rule? That it doesn't matter if you're Jew or Greek, male or female, black or white, red, yellow, green, Martian, whatever. It doesn't matter. I don't think Martians can get saved. I don't think there are Martians. Okay. As many as walk according to this rule, peace and mercy be upon them and upon the Israel of God. The Bible talks a lot about the God of Israel, but guess what? We are the Israel of God if we are a new creature. If we are born again, if we're born of the Spirit, if we have the new nature in us, if we receive the Holy Spirit, we're a new creature. And you know what? God's idea all along was to make all men in relationship with him. He wasn't all about race. He was about that new creature. And, uh, you know, our God is actually... The same God is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I mean, it's cool to look at that in the Old Testament. It's cool to watch a movie about it. Boy, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That's our God. That's our God. He is a, a Jew, not who is one outwardly, but whose circumcision is of the heart, right? It sounds like Bible, and I think it is. Here's, this is cool. Now, this is... This is maybe my favorite part of the whole Bible. And I probably overstate that because I probably said that a lot, but we've been watching the Gospel of John, the movie. There's one that is really, really great. He's got a great Jesus. He's not an angry Jesus. He's a pretty joyful Jesus. Don't you think being, if you were God, you'd be pretty joyful, amen? It's like, oh, praise God, I'm God. Amen. So, uh, so, yeah, he rebukes a few Pharisees, but for the most part, he does it with a smile. But look at John 8.56. He was talking to the 
the crowd and to the Pharisees and they were going back and forth about who their father was. John 8, 56, your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day and he saw it and was glad. Then the Jews said to him, you are not yet 50 years old and have you seen Abraham? And in this movie it depicts them all laughing. They were just laughing. You're not even 50. And then this, it gets super quiet and I just love this. I love this right here. Jesus said to them, most assuredly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. Oh my gosh. That is the most powerful statement he ever made that he was God. Jesus is God. Jesus is God. And he is our God. Let Israel rejoice in their maker. The Bible, you know, the world talks about, you know, that's your truth, you know, but my truth is that, well, guess what? Jesus is God, that's our truth. And guess what? It happens to be true. Everything else is a lie. That's our truth, that Jesus is God. He is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and he is. And he said, I am. Tell him I, what did, what did God tell Moses? Tell him I am sent me. You know who that was? Jesus. Jesus. It's one and the same. Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Philip, what's going on? You said, he said, show me the Father and that'll be good for me. These guys, three and a half years with him, opening blind eyes, raising the dead, and they're like, yeah. John the Baptist, are you the one or should we? And this movie kind of depicts him kind of shaking his head. It's like, oh my gosh. Wouldn't it be hard? You know, it's hard enough to be spiritual around dull people. Can you imagine being God? <laughs> it's like, you know, and you can't sin, so you can't have a really bad attitude, but I can just see him, oh, you know, face palm all the time. So, oh my gosh. It's like, beam me up. Can we be done with this mission? Let them praise his name with the dance. Let them sing praises to him with the timbrel and harp. You know, we got to dancing a little bit on Thanksgiving. If you were here, you missed it. I'd like to see more of that. I'd like to see more of that. Do you remember David? How excited he got when the ark was coming back into Jerusalem? Now, I don't recommend this, but he took off all his clothes. He was in his underwear and he was dancing with all his mouth. I think he had a tambourine. He might have had a praise ring. I don't know what all he had. But he didn't have a lot of clothes on. Do you think he was sinning? That's what his religious wife was saying. You're just showing off instead of in front of all the Lulu Bells out there, all those lustful girls. That's what you're doing. He's like, you think that's undignified? He said, I'll be more undignified than this. <laughs> I will get more undignified than this because, you know, it says, uh, uh, it says, um, the Lord takes pleasure in his people He'll beautify the humble with salvation. You know what David was doing out there in his underwear? He was being humble. He was being humble. He didn't care what absolutely anybody thought, including his wife. I don't care. I'm doing this before the Lord. Right? He was being humble. Some say, oh, look at them, they're all in the flesh, they're dancing and they're just carrying on, just want to be seen. That's what his wife was saying, right? Do you want to see, do you, you know, David was being humble. Do you want to see, do you want to see pride? Do you want to see pride? Can't believe you're doing that. Can't believe you're dancing like that, right? It's not the people that are boisterous and not caring what anybody thinks that are prideful. It's those that are just sitting there judging them. I've seen so many people. Here's the favorite thing. Now, I'm not picking on you because you've got that pose right there. But I've seen a lot of pre prophetic people do this in a meeting. Like they're the thinker or something, right? Just be on notice. I'm checking you all out. Lord, if you, if you are so close to the Lord, get up here and be dancing. 
Take your clothes off if you need to, but be humble before the Lord. No, don't do that. But being demonstrative in worship is not pride. It is not arrogance. It is being humble before the Lord and not caring what anybody thinks. Here it is, humility. Latin humilitas. In ethics, freedom from pride and arrogance. I like that. Freedom from pride and arrogance. And it goes on, it says here, it says uh, at the end there, a submission to the divine will. You know, different men of God I've known in my life, I've, I've, I've given him this epitaph. And, I, and one of them I think is Mike Leisner. And he went to be on with the Lord. What I've said about him, and you knew, knew him, Rock, I would say he's a guy that will do anything for God. He was a guy that would do anything for God. Don't you want that to be your epitaph? Boy, that's, that brother, that sister, they would do absolutely anything for God. That's, that's being yielded to his will. Amen? Oh my gosh, we're not even to verse 5 yet. It says in Proverbs 15, 33, before honor is humility. I wrote this. There is a beauty and peace in people who have yielded to God, who do not strive, and who do not worry. Doesn't it say that? It says that he will beautify the humble with salvation. There's a beauty and peace in people who have yielded to God who do not strive and do not worry. Verse 5, let the saints be joyful in glory. Let them sing aloud on their beds. I believe this here is beginning to contrast the public worship and the private worship. Sing aloud on your bed. Don't just... if. You, if you're only doing it in public, you do have a problem. <laughs> I'll just say that. You do have a problem. If you're never worshiping God unless you're in public, and then it's like, whoo, look at me. Praise God. I'm super Christian, and then you tear your head off of your whole family and kick your dog. That's not what, that's not the ideal. Amen. Let the saints be joyful in glory. Let them sing aloud on their beds. You know, you can have a lot of glory right in your own bedroom. You know that? You can have a lot of glory right in your own bedroom. My, uh, my downstairs, that's sacred for me. I, I get a lot of glory down there. Mark was saying just the other night, he woke up in the middle of the night and he just, he just had a song in his heart and he just sang to the Lord for like an hour. Hallelujah. You ever had that happen? It's something that God does in our hearts. Anna told me before she's, had, she's woken up and... I, <laughs> In the middle of the night, I'll just be going off praying in tongues in my sleep. You should get something in your heart in public, and you should manifest it in private too. Amen? Let the saints be joyful in glory. Let them sing aloud on their beds. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but in Psalm 63, in verse 6, it says, When I remember you on my bed, I meditate you, I meditate on on you in the night watches. You know, you can prime that pump a little bit. Read a little scripture right before you go to bed. Meditate on a scripture right before you go to bed. I prescribe that a lot to people that have bad dreams. But just one thought, meditate on that. You will ruminate like a cow on that thing all night. And you know, you might, you might wake up your mate just speaking it out loud, but it's going in your spirit and your soul. Let the high praises of God be in their mouth and a two-edged sword in their hand. Is this a literal physical sword? It might be. <laughs> it might be. God blesses people in every walk of life. If you're in the military, you're carrying a sword or an M16 or anything like that, God blesses you, right? And he wants you to be engaged. But it says... Uh, I'm going to look at a different edge because Anna, Anna hit on it a little bit during worship. Let the high praises of God be in their mouth and a two-edged sword in their hand. We, we've seen the effects, and I've preached on it more recently, the effects of praises, right? Yeah. What happens to the enemy when we're praising? 
He might scatter, he might get all in confusion, he might get confused, right? He might uh, put him in fear, it might put him to flight when we are, we are in praises. But it says, um, have high praises in your mouth and a two-edged sword in your hand. Well, the, biblically, the two-edged sword, look at 2 Thessalonians 2.8. I'm going to do this quickly and we're going to close with a proclamation. 2 Thessalonians 2.8, and when the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. And look at Revelation 1.16. This echoes this. Revelation 1.16. He had in his right hand seven stars. Those are the angels of the seven churches. You know that? Those are the apostles or pastors of those churches. He said, uh, out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword and his countenance was like the sun shining in his strength. That sounds just like Thessalonians, doesn't it? Out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. Do you think that he had a regular steel sword, you know, like maybe he had a big grill and then out of that came, no. See what it's talking about. Revelation 19.11. I'm not going to read this whole thing. Well, I'm going to read it quickly. Revelation 19.11. Now I saw heaven open and behold a white horse. And he who sat on him was called faithful and true. And in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes were like a flame of fire. And on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no one knew except himself. His robe, his, he was clothed with a robe dipped in blood. And his name is called the Word of God. Do you know who that is? And the armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword that with it he should strike the nations. And that's all I'm going to read of that. Going down to verse 21. All the armies gathered together in this battle. He threw the beast and the pro false prophet into the lake of fire. And then it says, And the rest were killed with the sword which proceeded from the mouth of him who sat on the horse. That sword, I believe, that he's talking about is truth. That sword is truth. That sword is the word of God. You know what? We can all walk in truth. 1 John 1 talks a lot about that. My little children walk in truth. Now, uh, when Jesus speaks something, when Jesus speaks truth, and that light coming out, that's more like a laser beam, right? <laughs> when we speak it out, too often, it's our own words, and that's got about the power of a flashlight, right? So have you seen some of these military weapons of war, the, the lasers? They can melt down tanks from a long distance. I mean, the la it's focused light. It's just focused light. You know, truth is the thing that we have truly in common with God. We can't have the same nature as far as being uncreated, being divine. There's a lot of things we can't be, but you know what? We can be in truth, and that is our common denominator with God. And there's nothing more true than the Word of God, right? There is nothing more true than the Word of God. So when we line up with the Word of God, our light becomes less like a flashlight and becomes more like a laser. You should never argue with anybody about the things of God from your own opinion or your own doctrine. This is our only foundation, the Word of God, right? The sharp two-edged sword is truth. The Word of God is, I said it before, our absolute truth. Hebrews 4.12, the Word of God is living and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword piercing even to the division of soul and spirit, joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. So 
So let's recap quickly. Let the high praises of God be in their mouth, verse 6, a two-edged sword in their hand. And then verse 7 says, why? To execute vengeance on the nations and punishments on the people. Is that our own personal responsibility? To go out and physically do that? The context here is truth. We make declarations and decrees over nations with the word of God. Do you know that you can affect nations by proclamations and declarations? Have you ever prayed over a world map? Do it sometimes. It gives you a bigger perspective. Doesn't it say that we're seated with him in heavenly places? You just, you can lay your hands on all of China. Lord, I touch China right now. I thank you that you are willing that none pair. I mean, you can affect nations. Some declarations. Psalm 9, 9 verse 17. The wicked shall be turned into hell and all nations that forget God. Proverbs 14, 34. I say this a lot when we're praying. That's why we're believing God for this nation. Righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. We can pray over nations, particularly our nation. Amen? If you read Psalm 2, what did Jesus say? Ask of me, and I'll give you the nations for your inheritance. We can affect nations with truth, with the word of God from our lips. We make declarations over the wicked, with the word of God. We make declarations over the wicked with the word of God, and you probably heard me pray this a lot of times. Proverbs 26, 27. Whoever digs a pit will fall into it, and he who rolls a stone will have it rolled back on him. How many want all the cheaters in this election? to get exposed and have the stones that roll and roll back on them. Amen? But I got no authority than the word of God to pray over these situations. Oh, Lord, help, uh, you know, help Trump win, help Trump win. We have, we can execute vengeance on the wicked with the word of God. These things are declared over the wicked. To bind their kings with chains and their nobles with fetters of iron. To execute on them the written judgment. The judgments are already written, folks. We don't write the judgments. We don't make up the judgments. We, by the word of God, can execute the judgments that are already written. Is that right? We don't write the judgments. We execute them through the word of God. We're just, hey, this is our constitution, and we are a a church of law and order, right? Right? Like, you think you should get on into this all this much? You think our founders didn't get into these concepts and ideas? I am so amazed that the things we're going through right now were thought about by the... the, the, It seems like the Lord downloaded every what if to them. Because every time we get into these jams, there seems to be something in the Constitution that can help us out of those jams. Amen? Do you think that that Constitution is divine? I think so. And so the judgments are already written and we can take the word of God and execute with it. I think you mentioned this, Matthew 18. This is so, this is so, if you can't get excited about this right here, you're going to have to check your pulse. Turn to the person next to you and check their pulse if they don't get excited when I say this. Matthew 18, 18. Assuredly, I say to you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, I say to you, if two of you agree on earth concerning anything they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. Does that get you excited? I mean, whatever you bind on earth... It might give you a little bit better perspective about praying what's going about praying over what's going on in our nation and maybe not just pray and start doing some of these decrees, these declarations for our na- nation. Amen. 
what does it say? This honor, it's an honor. This honor have all his saints. And, and, yeah. and then what does it say again? Praise the Lord. Everybody say, praise the Lord. Praise we have an honor, amen? We have an honor to execute the judgments written. So we're going to do a little decree. And uh, we're going to all stand. And uh, don't put that up yet. Then people will just read it. We're going to make a decree, and I hope it stirs something in your spirit. Does anybody get anything out of this? Yes. Yes. Amen. Now I've got to wake you up again. Now, I've told you before, these decrees do not work unless you say it very boldly and loudly, okay? This is not the quiet part of the service. This is the loud part, okay? Okay, so I'm going to say uh, uh, part of it, and then you're going to repeat after me. Is everybody ready? Okay, put that up there. We declare and decree. We are not victims. We are not bystanders. We are in a battle. We are engaged. We have weapons. We will praise. We will fight. We will overcome. We will overcome. In Jesus' name, give the Lord a hand of praise. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. 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 We will overcome. We will.